Well, welcome back, everybody. Today is Molecular Biology 4. Uh, it's a minute and some odd on the clicker clock. A um, couple things. Curtis White, if you're here, uh, come and see me. I have some papers for you. Um, announcement. Well, today I want to talk about two somewhat unrelated things. Uh, first one is mRNA processing, which is this weird thing that doesn't seem particularly necessary, but is a fact. Um, and then I want to talk about gene regulation, because people have been asking how does, why are some genes on and some not, and this is a particularly good example of that, why you're he or she. In lab, there is no lab this week. Uh, there will be lecture on Wednesday, though. Um, Warm-up number 10 is due Wednesday morning. Um, and there's exam three information in today's information pack handout. Uh, future overheads will have all the details, but basically it's Monday, uh, same assignments where you go depending on your last name. Logistical or administrative questions, excuse me, before we get down to business. Okay. So, all right, well, we'll wait. I guess we'll hang for 30 seconds while a clicker clock counts down. Everybody's so nice and quiet. I hate to lose that vibe, but I... Wait. Rang up too much time. All right, nine, eight, seven, six. All right. All right. So, I'm sorry we're trying to track down where those huge explosion sounds come from. We actually think it's the construction workers' radios interfering with this radio, but we don't really know. Uh, hopefully, it will go away. In any case, C is the majority answer and is correct. B, um, D, which is one of the second most popular ones, um, is a bit of terminology, introns and exons. Uh, like introns are the things you ought to keep in. It turns out that's the wrong way to think about it. You should erase that idea from your brain. We'll talk about more terminology in a second. But basically the idea is that there is this weird thing that after transcription, these things called introns are removed. And that only happens in eukaryotes, stuff like us, cells that have a nucleus. So we'll talk about that in a bunch of details, the first thing for today. So most, most people are on the same page as, as where we want people to be. So, let me talk about exons and introns. This is otherwise known as mRNA processing. And that's in eukaryotes only. Bacteria don't do this. So what we talked about in general is you go DNA to RNA to protein. Well, this one, it's DNA to RNA. You mess around with the RNA and you go to protein. So let me show you there's an intermediate step. And people oftentimes get goofed up by this because it isn't at all clear why it should be there. And I want to say a little bit about that at the end. Transcription produces what we call a pre-mRNA. And you would have seen that on Gene Explorer. And it had some strangely colored pieces that I want to now sort of illustrate here. So your pre-mRNA has a five prime end and it would extend to a three prime end. And let's just say it has A, B, C, D, E, F. All right, so those aren't DNA sequences clearly because B is not a nucleotide. They're like regions of the gene. So this bunch of bases, rather than writing out a sequence which would be difficult to, to, to copy down, I just use a familiar string of letters to indicate those various parts. And what you might have in this RNA is it would be organized into exons. So exon one are typically drawn as blocks and intervening sequences intron one, and then you might have another exon two, and then an intron number two, and then an exon number three. Right. And there's a couple things. How are these, how do these um, boxes know their boxes and not? 
is that there are signal sequences at the beginning of each intron. And so these are start intron signal sequence. Right, and there's one of them here. And then there's also going to be, um, draw it a slightly different symbol, a red square at the end of each intron, an end intron signal sequence. Right there. All right. And the idea is, so there's two of these. Oops, colors right. Each intron has a start and an end. Right. And so just like every other process we've talked about, there's some machine that reads a sequence. And that machine needs a start signal and a stop signal. So promoters test RNA, RNA polymerase looks for promoters and terminators. Ribosomes looks for start codons and stop codons. Splicing machinery looks for start intron sequences and end intron sequences. They don't have fancy names, just start and end. So it's a particular sequence of RNA nucleotide that says start an intron here, and keep splicing it out until you get to this point, and then stop splicing. And let me show you what the splicing, uh, what, what, what that means in the next drawing. So, um, two splicing is based on signal sequences and Intron, let me write this really neatly because this is important. Introns are removed. They are depolymerized. And they are recycled. Okay. Break them down to nucleotides and use them over. Exons are kept and joined. All right. And the terminology for this is just plain awkward. It's another one of those things, right? You might think intron means they stay in. Uh -uh. So that's the thing you want to try to erase from your brain. The idea is introns are intervening sequences. There's stuff in the middle you throw away. Exons are expressed, right? That's just the way the terms got um, invented. So introns are intervening sequences. So those sequences in between that we throw away. And the exons are expressed. They are kept. And so what do I mean by that? The, the, after splicing is done, the exons are joined like this so that the regions A, B, and C are present. G, H, and I are present. And M and N are present. Here's a 5 prime end and a 3 prime end. Okay. And these things here, these are a seamless joint. That is, they can even break in the middle of a codon. So let me say, to sort of reiterate. So sequences D, E, and F, and J, K, and L, gone, removed, snipped out, depolymerized down to nucleotides, and recycled, right? Um, and the other parts are joined seamlessly. So if you looked at this RNA, there would be no way to know that something had been snipped out there. Like if you look in GeneX, it's just RNA. There's no way to know that there had been an intron there. It's all been removed, right? And again, it can break in the middle of a codon. So um, this is this weird thing, right? When, I, when, we're first, when I first learned about it, it was just a fact, and it was what they sort of called junk DNA. It's like, why bother transcribing that huge long RNA and throwing it away? And it turns out, in some cases, in many human genes, you throw away up to 90% of the RNA. You go to the total, making this humongous RNA, 90% gets thrown away, 10% gets kept, and then goes on for translation. Why would you do that? At the time, when we first discovered this, it was not at all clear. It's still not entirely clear. It turns out, however, it's beyond the scope of Bio 111, but sometimes a single gene can make more than one protein by controlling which exons get kept and which get skipped. Like sometimes they'll skip exon two. 
So you're missing some codons, the pro protein's different. It turns out that's an economical way to have one gene make several proteins. Um, it just happens to be so. So in things other than bacteria, so uh, humans, plants, animals, all that sort of stuff, we have this bizarro thing where the introns are removed and the exons are kept. And again, it's done by its particular signal sequence. Questions about that odd thing before we talk about a little bit what happens is a few more steps. So when you look at gene X, you would have seen the results of this if you go back and play with it again, especially for the, for the warm-up. All right, let me say there's a little bit more to say about processing because the other note details you might notice if you look at RNAs in gene X is that there's the final round of processing. There's a cap at the five prime end and a, a tail at the three prime end are added. So you've got your um, RNA, your, your ABC, your GHI, and your MN. And there's a cap, a special nucleotide added at the five prime end, and then a string of A's to the three prime end. That's this tail are added. And this is now the mature mRNA. And here it's not, again, not clear why these exist. It is likely that the cap and the tail are added last, and so signal this thing is done being spliced. It's okay to translate. There are like markers that say, processing's done, you can go ahead and translate it, because the next steps are, number four is the mature mRNA is exported from the nucleus And then number five, the mature mRNA is translated by ribosomes in the cytoplasm. And so the thing is, if you think about it, the start codons probably in, in the beginning and the stop codons near the end. If you tried to translate a, a not completely spliced RNA, you'd start translating through the introns, which is all these weird junk codons, not something you, stuff that you don't want to translate. So the, the poly A tail and the cap on the end are added when splicing is done to signal, okay, splicing's done. It's okay to ship this out of the nucleus. It's good to go. It's good to be translated. So there is this odd artifact of, that's true of, of human and eukaryotic genes. It's not a bacteria. It is. People are coming to understand more about why, but mostly it just is. Questions? Okay. All right. Let me just, I want to make a small summary here. As I said, all these processes have control sequences. So the process control sequence. make a little table here, and then is it the same in all organisms? So transcription is controlled by promoters and terminators, and these are, no, these are not the same in all organisms. That is, a promoter sequence in, in a bacterium would not work for the RNA polymerase in, in, in our cells and vice versa. Splicing is controlled by start and stop intron sequences. These are also not the same in all organisms. Translation is by start and stop codons and they are the same. Yes. Okay. That is, start and stop codons, the genetic code, it turns out, and the genetic code is universal. There are some very small exceptions. The cool thing about genetic code is CCC encodes proline in every living thing on Earth. 
which is why recombinant day DNA works, that you can take a gene from a human and put it in a bacterium, and it will make the same protein because the codons are exactly the same. Promoters and a lot of other stuff won't work, but the fundamental coding region part will work. So that's one point from all this. The other point about this is all of these machines are independent of one another. RNA polymerase knows promoters and terminators. It doesn't know anything about codons, doesn't know anything about splicing. It says, I see a promoter, I will make an RNA until I see a terminator. I don't care what's in between. It minds its own business. Splicing things, they look in RNAs for start and end intron sequences and they splice them. They don't know anything about codons, anything else down the line, they just do their, they mind their business, they splice things. Likewise, the ribosome, it finds a start codon, it rolls along until it makes a stop codon. It doesn't care whether that protein's good, bad, or indifferent. It just minds its own business and follows the instructions that it's given. Questions about those? Yeah. Tell me what you mean. Do they all work at the same time? There is a kind of a sequence that is transcription happens first, then splicing, then translation. That's certainly true. Yeah, yeah. All right. What I want to do now is draw sort of a big double line. We've talked about this a number of times, that the DNA in every one of your cells is the same. And to a first approximation, the DNA in everybody's cells in this room is the same, with a separate variation that makes us look a little bit different. Yet, although the DNA is the same in every cell in my body, my cells look different one from the other. How is that? Because some genes are expressed in some cells and not others. That is, DNA replication copied everything in the DNA. Transcription, on the other hand, only copies selected things. And that's how different cells look different from each other. So I wanted to give an example of that because there's some interesting principles there. And there are many different ones we could look at. What I want to pick up on is a case of human sex, the, the case of human sex determination. The reason for that is you can actually trace it all the way back to the very beginning. What is the fundamental thing that makes a difference between whether you're going to be a he or a she, and how does that work uh, at, the, at the molecular level? So what I want to show you to start, this picture is not in your information-packed handout, but it's just to, to illustrate um, what, what I want to talk about here. So this is, um, so the development of, of sex organs in humans. It's also true in mammals, all mammals. The sort of surprising thing, when you're second, in the second or third month of pregnancy, you can't tell externally whether you're a he or a she. This is a sort of, uh, down, sort of pelvic region, right? You've got your bladder, uh, rectum, all that sort of stuff. It turns out at two to three months of, second or third month of pregnancy, you have stuff that's basically both. That is, at this stage, all of us started off, although we were going to be one or the other, you start out with sort of both. You're kind of in between. Then uh, you differentiate. All right. You would think that the external parts of he's and she's are sufficiently different that how could they possibly come from the same thing? But if you look down, what happens is there's a couple things, basically. There are these Mullerian structures and these Wolfian structures, and that we all start with both. And if you're going to go down the road to being a female, the Mullerian structures get larger and the, fem and the Wolfian structures get smaller, and it's vice versa for males. And so it turns out from starting with basically the same equipment, Different parts grow disproportionately, and you end up with stuff that's either a he or a she. And it's one of the interesting things is there's leftover remnants. In a she, there are still some remnants of the, um, the Wolfian structures. And in, the, in males, there's a little bit of left of the Mullerian structures. Right? But basically, we all start with roughly the same raw materials, and then at some, at, at, at starting a few months into pregnancy, a differentiation happens. And that depends on whether you're XX or whether you're XY. Right? So you knew, at, even before your genitals had differentiated, you were going to be a he or a she. But the differentiation doesn't happen until somewhat later in development. And so the question is, how do you get, how does this work? How does it, so that given that um, the genes of males and females are so very similar, how is it that we end up looking so different? 
So just to fill in some of the details, in males, so that male symbol, you start with both, both Wolfian, uh, I always get this wrong, Wolf, F, F, Wolfian, that is male structures, and malarian, female parts. Then, in males, you repress malarian structures. And it turns out this happens because of, this is triggered by a protein called anti-malarian hormone. Very creative name, AMH for short. So basically, in he's, a hormone is made, AMH, and that acts throughout the body, but especially on genitalia, to produce male parts. So that turns off the, um, I'm sorry, that to turn off the female structures. You also, so that just means you're not female. You also have to be actually male. You have to activate the Wolfian structures. And that's triggered by, we'll call them proteins A, B, and C. They are as yet unknown. So people are still trying to figure out all of the details. But basically, to make me into a he, you had to turn off the she parts and turn on the he parts. It's a two, it's a two, two sides of that coin. Right? And to be a she, it's the other way around. You have to turn off the male parts and on the female parts. Right? We'll take the case of males because it's easier to explain. There's no particular reason to do it this way, but it turns out to be slightly easier to explain. So to make so that about half, slightly less than half of the people in this room, this happened to you early in development. Right? And so the question is, how does this work? And so I want to put together a bunch of things about genes and, and gene expression here. Pardon? Yeah. So there are people who are intersex, there are various ways this can not function the way it ought to. And you can end up with people who are intersex. And there's a whole, and we'll talk about this, and you, some of them you can imagine, there's a whole bunch of other ones that happen. But yeah, it's, some, yikes, something that, uh, I hope it wasn't something I said. Um, it, it, it's definitely things that affect this process. Is that, it's absolutely right. Yeah. So the difference between someone who's intersex and someone who's hermaphrodite, I actually don't know, all right? So, what, so and also to be, to be clear, there's a whole bunch of things about gender. There's like what you identify as, there's who you choose as a mate, there's all these things. I'm just talking about your external parts uh, for the moment, right? The, uh, the, your genitalia, all right? Rather than uh, any of the many other parts that are part of gender and, and sexuality. Let me ask the following. I want to ask a sort of on-the-fly clicker question. AMH, A, B, C genes are only um, only present. The genes are only present in males. All right. So there are several things that could explain this. All right. B, AMH. A, B, C genes are present in both females and males. C, none of the above. And D, I don't know. All right. So basically the question is, to make a he, you need AMH and these mystery proteins A, B, and C. Is that because the genes for those proteins are only present in males, or are they present in both males and females? So let me fire up the clicker, um, and you guys can beam on in.
And this may involve some speculation on your part, but if you think back to what we said about genes and chromosomes, um, it might make some sense. I'm going to knock a little time off. It looks like most people have beamed in. Let me just take, take it down to 30 seconds so we can move on. All right, let's see what we got here. So the majority answer is B. It's in both he's and she's. So somebody who, why would you give that argument? What would be the, an argument in favor of that answer? Somebody raise your hand. Yeah. Say it again. Oh, I should be, so I should be careful. The AMH is, the protein is present in males. So the question is, is the gene also present in females? So let me, let me put it this, yeah. So you want to say it's present, but it's not expressed. So let me give an argument for why it should be present, which is that what, we, what I said way back when, is that the only thing that's, only genes that are present only in males are going to be on the Y chromosome, and there's hardly any genes there. And so it, that's one argument for this. It turns out in point of fact to be true, that those genes are present in both he's and she's, they're just not expressed. So let me, that's the sort of message of today's lecture that I want to talk about. The answer is B is correct, which is the majority answer. Is, so the question is, so how are AMH a, B, and C proteins only, the proteins are only present in males. Right? Because I, we've all got the genes, so how come we aren't all he's? Right? And the answer is because of gene regulation. So I want to talk about how this process works. There are many kinds. This is what's called transcriptional regulation. Okay. How? I've alluded to this, but I want to put this explicitly. So thus far, we've talked about strong promoters. That is, RNA Paul always binds, therefore the mRNA is always made, therefore the protein is always made. This is what's called a constitutive promoter. It is part of its constitution that it works. It always produces a protein. We know that can't be true. If the AMH gene and all A, Bs, and Cs were done by, driven by constitutive promoters, we would all be males. Right? There would be no females in this room. So it has to be more complicated than that. 
So that's what I want to talk about today. But some promoters are not good matches for RNA polymerase. Therefore, they're not transcribed much, if at all, unless a helper protein, which goes by the more formal name, an activator protein binds to a DNA sequence near the promoter. And this DNA sequence is called an enhancer sequence and helps RNA polymerase bind. Therefore, the gene is only transcribed when the activator is present. So this is the secret of how you're a he or a she. The genes, we all have the genes for being both he and she. In this particular case, if they were turned on all the time, we would all be he. So there must be something funny about the promoters for those genes so that they don't always work. And the answer is the promoters on those genes need a little bit of help. RNA polymerase won't stick. It kind of grabs on and goes, yeah, it's not quite the right sequence. I'm going someplace else. Unless a protein binds in the neighborhood to a different DNA sequence, sticks to RNA polymerase, and helps it get started. It's called an activator protein binding to an enhancer sequence. If that happens, then those genes get turned on. So the secret of why I'm a he and not a she has got to do with turning those particular genes on. So what I want to tell you now is a story of activator proteins and enhancer sequences that go from me having a Y chromosome to me ending up being a he, or people who don't have a Y ending up, not being, ending up being a she. So let me show you um, how this works. I think this will be clearer with an example. So this is a gene regulation pathway. Okay. It starts with one of the few genes on the Y chromosome. It's a gene called SRY. And it encodes an activator protein right, that triggers male development. Right? And so how does this work? So what I'm going to draw is a rather complicated diagram, and I'm going to have people think about it, right? Because it's a it's a long story. It's kind of like, you know, your leg bone connected to your knee bone connected to your foot bone or whatever. It's this, this triggers this, triggers that. But if you, the details are all things we, that are understandable. So let's take it piece by piece. So on the Y chromosome, I'm sure if I can draw this up, it fits all on one screen. There's the SRY gene. And that's one of the few genes that actually works on the Y chromosome. It's in the DNA there. And it has a constitutive promoter. So if you've got a Y chromosome, so in me and all of the guys in the room, our Y chromosome, there's an SRY gene and it's cranking out SRY protein all the time. If we draw, um, I draw it in a different color, if this is the SRY protein, so that gene is always making the SRY protein. Right. There's another gene on chromosome number 19, and this is the SOX9 gene. Right? 
And these things have rather undescriptive names from how they were, it has to do more or less with how they were isolated. And what happens is this thing has a weak promoter. That is, this is not transcribed unless SRY binds to the enhancer. So the enhancer is a sequence up here, draw a zigzaggy line. And what happens then, if SRY binds, why does it bind there? It recognizes that sequence. If SRY binds, then our old friend RNA polymerase will transcribe it. So is, if SRY is there, so the idea is that promoter is weak. So RNA polymerase normally, eh, meh, I'm not going to bind to that. I'm not going to transcribe it. If SRY is there, it sticks to RNA polymerase. Hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, all that sort of stuff goes. And so RNA is, polymerase is happy enough to transcribe the SOX9 gene. SOX9 gene makes, um, we'll do it in blue, makes the um, SOX9 protein. All right. And then the last bit, um, last player here, this is also um, chromosome number 19 by coincidence. There's the AMH, finally, the AMH gene. And that thing also has a weak promoter and it's not transcribed um, unless SOX9 is present. And so SOX9 has it, its own enhancer sequence that it recognizes and SOX9 binds and then if that binds, RNA polymerase binds and you get the AMH protein and that leads to being a male phenotype. Okay. So like I said, there's a lot here, this sort of knee bone, thigh bone thing. What I want to do is have people think about this. The following question, are these present or not? SRY, I'm going to make a table, SRY, SOX9, and AMH. And for each, I'm going to ask about the gene and the protein. Yes and no. Gene and protein. Gene and protein. All right? And I'm going to ask, I don't want to scoot this down because I want you guys to be able to see this whole picture, but my two columns here, are, two rows, are going to be males and females. And this is going to take a while to puzzle out, but I want to make sure everybody's there. Best way to think about this is start with the genes. If you're a male, is the SRY gene present? Is the SRY protein present? X is the SOX9 gene present? Is the protein going to be present? Start from the gene and go to the protein. So do males first and then females, based on what I said up there. Like I said, it's not trivial, but I want a table of Ys and Ns, and it's easiest to start with gene and go to protein, and do it for males and for females. So think about it. There's a lot there, but like I said, start with the DNA and go from there.
So we'll take this piece by piece. First we'll do gene and then we'll do protein. So get a consensus and I'll, I'll call a name. All right. All right, so let's do it. See where we get. Elliot, Elliot, are you here? Elliot, Elliot. Elliot going once, Elliot going twice. Elliot, your clicker was here, but not you. That makes, that causes a problem for me. All right, uh, next, Levi. Levi, let's start. SRY gene in males, present, pardon? No, you can pick anything you like. Sure. So for males, you want to say AMH, the gene is present. Um, thank you, Levi. So you want to do the gene is present and the protein is present. And how do you know that? That's right. So those proteins got to be made. That's what makes me a he. I want to start. I actually want to start here, though, because it's where the whole thing begins. So it doesn't have to be you. Yes or no? Is that gene, SRY gene present in males? Yes. yes. That's because it's on the Y chromosome and we got them. So let's actually let me scooch this up a little bit. Females. So the SRY gene is present in males. Is it present in females? No. no. Because you don't have a Y chromosome. All right. All right. Now the SRY. Now let's go back to males. Sorry. SRY protein present in males. Why is it present in males? Somebody raise your hand. Well, you need to make the. But it's more than just having the gene. You need the protein. That's a constitutive promoter. Because it's a constitutive promoter, you always make the protein. Yes, it's constitutive. All right. SOX9, gene present in males? Yes, because how do you know that? A couple things. It's on chromosome 19. What does that mean? Is that an autosome or a sex chromosome? It's an autosome. means everybody's got two copies, all right? So now what? SOX9 protein, present or absent? Uh, there's a lot of silence out there. Uh, how do you know? What makes SOX9 present or not? What controls whether it's present or not? SRY. Is SRY present? Yes. So that means SOX9 is present. So this basically this is the protein activates, makes the protein. And as a result, like what Levi said, this protein activates this gene, the AMH gene, and that's why I'm a he. All right. So what about females? Are females going to, let me write this down a little bit lower so there's a little more space. Females do not have the SRY gene. Do they have the SRY protein? No. Do they have the SOX9 gene? Yes. yes, because it's on an autosome. Everybody's got one. Do they have the SOX9 protein? No, because it's not being activated. Do they have the AMH gene? Yes, because on chromosome 19, we all get two copies. Do they have the AMH, pro AMH protein? No, because there's no SOX9 to turn it on. So as a result, you're a he. As a result, you're a she. All right. Let me take this one step further. Genotype and phenotype as a way to get at questions here. We might run a tiny bit over. XX are female. XY are male. All right. Fair enough. What about XY, but the SRY gene is inactivated by mutation? Think about that one for just a second and talk to your neighbor. Suppose the copy of SRY on that Y chromosome had a mutation in it so it doesn't do its job anymore. What would that person with their XY, but their Y with a, like a Y star, would they be a he or a she? Think about it. Talk to your neighbor. So we'll call it a star on that one. That's a messed up Y. <clears throat> yeah. 
be talking, but not, not just the beer. All right. So a consensus. Let me call a name. All right, let me give a second more since people are still talking. All right. Shanika. Shanika. Sorry. Shanika. Are you here, Shanika? Shanika. Going once. Shanika going twice. Another person. There's clickers here, but not them. That's not a good thing. Cost you a point. All right. Jade. Jade, are you here? Jade, 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 Jade. Tell me, he or she? You want to pass. All right, that's fair enough. Um, so, somebody want to take a stab at it? Female because why? Because SRY is inactivated, so that means that SOX9 is not present. That means that AMH is not present. You're going to develop as a female. So that would be female. All right, let me do one last one. Um, last one. So everybody's bored with two copies of the SOX9 gene, one from mom, one from, one from dad. What if you inherited a bad copy from, doesn't really matter, one bad copy makes no SOX9 protein, and the other copy makes perfectly fine SOX9 protein? He or she. I won't call names because we don't have some time, but think about it for a second, and we'll get people to volunteer. Let me fill in this while people are thinking so. No SRY, no SOX9, no AMH, female. All right, so hands for, a, hands for male. Hands for female. And there's a large undecided category. Now let's think this one through. What if both socks, sorry, what if both socks nines were gone? What would you be? You'd be female. With no socks nine, no AMH, you'd be female. So the question is you got one good copy. What's the usual rule for things like this? Doing something is dominant. What is the doing something in this case? Socks nine turning on AMH. So now what do you want to think about? Hands for male. Hands for female. All right, so we've got a majority for male. The answer is yes, is that this would be male. That is one copy of SOX9 is enough. Therefore, SRY, SOX9.